Hello everyone and welcome to a special edition of the India Story coming to you from in front of the White House in Washington DC in the United States. And we are here for a very specific reason. Because one of the most important aspects of the India Story for the last few years has been India's rise on the global stage. And more specifically, the ties and the relationships with the United States and with other countries of the West. And suddenly, just after a very successful G20, a bombshell seems to have been detonated into that relationship by some charges made by the Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We've all heard him standing there in Canadian Parliament accusing India of a targeted assassination of a Canadian citizen on Canadian soil. And that of course led to a storm. And we've had all sorts of criticism, a lot of people talking about it. Perhaps a more muted reaction from the US and countries in the West than Canada might have hoped for, but at least it led to a storm. Where does this lead to? Is this going to be a major storm? Is it going to be a passing shower? Or is it something which paradoxically could work out well by actually forcing the West to take on board India's concerns? That's what we're going to be talking about with some big, big experts here. We've got Michael Kugelman about to join us. Lisa Curtis is here with us. Gary uh, is joining us. The person who's written a book on uh, Canada and on the history of Khalistani terror and his possible shelters that it gets in Canada. He's going to be joining us. And Derek Grossman is with us as well, talking about how this is being seen, not just in Canada, but in other countries in the West. All of those experts coming up for you in just a couple of minutes. But before I go any further, let me quickly play for you the big news headlines that you should be tracking this week. India's External Affairs Minister S. J. Shankar discusses global developments during his wide-ranging talks with U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Talks come amid simmering diplomatic row between India and Canada over killing of Khalistani terrorists. J. Shankar is currently on a five-day official trip to Washington, D.C. in what comes as the highest level interaction between the two countries after New Delhi's recent G20 summit. Protests intensify in Indian state of Karnataka's Bengaluru and other parts over the Kaveri River water sharing brow with neighboring Tamil Nadu state. Latest round of protests in the decades-old dispute started after India's Supreme Court refused to interfere with an order telling Karnataka to release 5,000 cusecs of water daily to Tamil Nadu for 15 days. Meanwhile, political row erupts after opposition BJP and JDS slam ruling Congress for failing to protect farmers' interests and acting like an agent of the Tamil Nadu government. No sign of peace in Manipur even months after deadly protests erupted in the valley in May. Mob tries to attack Chief Minister N. Biren Singh's empty ancestral house despite security clampdown and curfew in capital Imphal. Security forces foil attempt after firing in air. Earlier in the week, Clashes and protest rallies rocked Imphal with thousands of students sloganeering against kidnapping and killing of two minors. At least 45 students were reportedly injured in clashes with the police on September 26th. Renowned agricultural scientist Swaminathan, also known as the father of Green Revolution in India, passes away. Swaminathan breathed his last on Thursday in Chennai due to age-related illness. He is survived by three daughters. Swaminathan's work revolutionized Indian agriculture in the 1960s and 1970s, ensuring food security and helping the country achieve self-sufficiency. So how exactly is this crisis panning out now? India, Canada, yes, those tensions are going to continue, but what effect is that going to happen with the rest of the West and specifically with the United States? Well, who better to ask than Michael Kugelman, who's South Asia Institute Director at the Wilson Center. Michael, thanks so much for joining us. Um, great to be here in front of the White House. We often talk on Zoom, but it's great to be here in person with other protests taking place out here. Absolutely. Um, what is your sense of where this crisis is at? It's now been eight, nine days. I don't see 
India trying to de-escalate or wanting to de-escalate and neither are the Canadians. How is the U.S. seeing this and how is the West seeing this? Well, I think that um, when this crisis first broke out, it was a um, major challenge, a major diplomatic, not a challenge, but uh, a, a conundrum for the United States in that it's relatively unusual for the U.S. to have to confront a diplomatic crisis involving two partners of each other, both of whom were very close partners of the U.S. as well. And so the U.S. had to be very careful about how it messaged its public reaction. Canada is a treaty ally, a neighbor, an intelligence ally, whereas India, of course, is a close strategic partner. But I would argue that um, over the last few days or so, we've been hearing less from Washington about this, at least publicly. I mean, we know that the U.S. has delivered its, its, its public message that it's very concerned about these allegations and that it wants India to uh, cooperate with Canada on the, in the investigation. But otherwise, the U.S. appears to have gone quiet publicly, which you know, I think is, is a reflection of how delicate but an issue it is. Actually, uh, I mean, the U.S. was actually quiet in the first couple of days, too, almost sort of taken by right. shock. And yeah. then... It seemed as if the U.S. was ratcheting up the pressure. You had that remark made by Ambassador Cohen. You had right. other statements coming out saying, uh, you know, I India needs to cooperate. Now it's sort of gone quiet again. Is it just because attention has moved elsewhere? Or has the United States perhaps realized this may not be the right issue to pick a, yeah. pick a major fight with India? Well, I think there, there, there are several factors at play here. One is that the U.S. has, has delivered the message it wanted to deliver, and it feels no need to, uh, to make any other public uh, pronouncements. I think we also cannot rule out the possibility that um, the messaging has gone private. Um, I think that the U.S. government certainly could be seen as a potential third-party mediator, uh, the actor that could sort of be in touch quietly, discreetly with both capitals to try to encourage them not to escalate further. So that could be happening. And as you know, in diplomacy, you know, the important things happen behind the scenes more so than in the public domain. I think in this case, the other thing which needs to be kept in mind is that there actually are two sides of the story. It's not as clear cut as it looked. And we yeah. heard uh, Mr. Jay Shankar saying that at the United Nations. Um, I think two things he said. One, rule, you can't have a world where there are rule givers and rule takers. Right. It has to be a bit more nuanced than that. And again, making the point about that our reaction to violence and terrorism cannot be conditional, cannot be based on who you are. And he didn't actually target Canada specifically or by name, mm -hmm. but the reference was crystal clear. Is that message something that you think he's also privately delivering here in Washington? Oh, absolutely, for sure. I mean, we know that for quite some time, India's government has been concerned about these, um, what it believes to be very significant security threats, security concerns. Um, and so I, I would not be surprised if, uh, if Jai Shankar is trying to deliver that message of trying to get the U.S. to understand India's position. And certainly there is a bit of a difference because, you know, as you know, I think that the U.S. would sort of lean more on the side of the need to be careful and upholding democratic principles and allowing activists to be out there, as long as they're nonviolent, of course, um, whereas, of course, India takes a very different position and would much prefer that Canada and other, other Western actors, including the United States, to pay more attention to this uh, presence of, um, of Sikh separatist sentiment. So the view in India has pretty much been 30 years or 40 years, we've tried to talk about this. And I think the reason why it's such an emotive issue is because it doesn't really exist inside India. It's almost as if somebody outside the country trying to reopen old wounds. And these are wounds that actually did spill a lot of blood in India. Right. I think yeah. that's the reason why there's been such an emotional and passionate response to this. And I think that's the reason why this is seen as a very serious issue in India. And I think that's also the reason why India's got so upset with Canada, that you're not taking this seriously enough, and you need to. Right. No, absolutely. And I, I think that I can understand India's position that uh, we've seen an increase in uh, these Khalistan uh, supporters demonstrating over the last few months. As you know, there were two incidents here in the U.S., in San Francisco, where the Indian consulate was attacked by, uh, or there were attempted attacks by Khalistan I mean, it supporters. Happened, it happened in London, but it the happened. Indian High Commission was attacked. Right, exactly. So so some near misses here. So I could understand India's concerns that it's almost like there's some type of, of, of comeback or resurgence of this Khalistan movement, even if it's thousands of miles away from Indian soil. So just to, just to rephrase that, there's no resurgence of the Khalistan movement, right? The, the Khalistan movement is dead. These are a bunch of people sitting in a foreign country, come out here and wave flags and saying, let's have a Khalistan movement or let's have a referendum. Right. So it's, it, it's, it's, it's not actually a, a movement which is, which is there in India, right? 
Well, of course, um, but I think this is part of the issue, um, you know, part of the crisis in that India is taking a very hard line and uh, has used terms like terrorism, extremism to refer to you know, these expressions of Sikh separatism uh, in the West, even though it's true. I mean, it's a very small number of demonstrators, and I would argue that you've got very sizable uh, Sikh communities here and in Canada, in both cases about 800,000 strong. And you know, the, the, the majority of them have no interest in, in Khalistan, and they're not, and certainly are not violent either. But you know, given how tense things are now between Canada and India, if you have even a few dozen Khalistan supporters coming out on the streets, congregating near Indian consulate facilities around Canada, burning effigies of, of Prime Minister Modi, obviously that's not going to help move the crisis toward a resolution. You know, protests like this, which we've been hearing for hours out here, are one thing. They're not actually inciting anybody to violence. There are no posters out there saying assassinate Indian right. diplomats, right? Which is a slightly yeah. different question. Which brings me to the question of you know the rules of the game. And I'm sure you've been hearing this a lot from various Indian interlocutors. In a situation where security threats, where there are terrorist threats to a country, the United States or many other countries in the West would not hesitate. Canada supported drone strikes in various parts of Right. You know, Afghanistan or Syria or other countries because they said it's a question of safety, it's a question of terrorism. I guess the question that India is asking and other countries will ask that question also is why don't those same rules apply to us? Right, I mean and part of the issue is you know a reflection of to put it mildly uh, you know, US in an inconsistent policy one could argue a, a policy that's hypocritical many would argue that um, the, the US decision to take out Qasem Soleimani in, in, in Iraq that was that was a state-sponsored assassination um, it's not just him and, and yeah, right. I mean, not, look at the number of drone strikes that took place right How many people yeah. died in drone strikes 10,000 yeah so there were many many people was, who were being right. killed in drone strikes some of them could have been innocent. There were lots of, there's tens of thousands of civilians. Around. Right, exactly. So, you know, my broader point is that I think a lot of this comes down to perceptions, threat perceptions, right? I mean, Khalistan, you know, those violent proponents of the Khalistan movement, it's not a direct threat to the United States. It's not a direct threat to the West because the, direct, the, the intended target is India. That's one reason for the disconnect, though certainly because what's left of the Khalistan movement, or if you want to call it a new phase of this Khalistan movement, they're, they're based in the West. They're based in Canada, the US, Australia, uh, the UK. And um, yeah, I think that the, and, you know, they are from operating from, uh, you know, from Canadian soil, from US soil, making threats to Indian diplomats based in the West. That's, that's a bit of a concern, I think, and I would think a point that Indian officials would want to make to their Western interlocutors, that yes, this may not be directed at you at the West, but you know, from Western soil, threats are being made against India. So, so two or three possible things in the forward. I'm sure everyone's going to wait for this evidence to see what the evidence is, and that's one if, part. If, if, it, if it comes. If yeah. it comes, if it exists, frankly, you know, we'll yeah. have to see what, what happens with that. But two other things, I think India is going to try and make a very strong point that you've got to do something about these Khalistani extremists and their soil. And a third is coming back to the question of the rule-based order. Right. Uh, the world is right now in a situation where you've got revisionist powers like China and Russia and Iran and others who are saying, what are the, we don't believe in the rules of the game. Um, the West would presumably want India to be aligned with the rule-based order, but then at some point a case has to be made what would be the fair rules mm -hmm. that would be applicable to everybody. Is there any thinking on that taking place in the building behind me or elsewhere here in Washington? Well, I mean, it's, it's quite striking, as I'm sure you noted, that when uh, Prime Minister Trudeau made his speech at the House of Commons, bringing out the allegations against India, he invoked that term, rules-based order. His view was that uh, an assassination by another government on Canadian soil represents a threat to the rules-based order. And of course, uh, Jai Shankar in his speech at the UN sort of sort of poked back at that, uh, I, I think. And but to be all for a rules-based order, but what is the rule, how right. should the rules-based order be defined? And it, it has to apply to everyone. And that's the problem, and it's, I think it's very relative, right? I mean, it's going to be defined differently in different contexts. Clearly, you know, the Indo-Pacific vision of a rules-based order is something that generally there's a lot of agreement from you know, Canada and the Five Eyes allies, India and others that are invested in this effort to counter China. But indeed, I mean, I think it's honestly, it's one of these catchphrases that, that will be invoked just because you know, you know you'll get a certain type of reaction because it's got that kind of currency. But at the end of the day, do we really know what a rules-based order actually is or is supposed to be? 
I'm not sure. There have been efforts to define it in the Indo-Pacific, but again, it's one of these catch-all terms. It's sort of so concerned. I've heard some commentary on the internet where it says, rules-based order means that you should not have assassinations in a, another democracy. Now that's one way of looking at uh, it. Or in a country where the rule of law or you know justice systems operate. And that's one way of defining it. But then the question is, what if that justice system is not operating as is in this case? With mm -hmm. The Canadians have not cooperated on terrorism. Then what happens to the rules based order? Right, so one could argue that it, uh, it takes a hit. But again, the core issue is how to define it and how to generate a broader global consensus around this idea and trying to uphold it. And, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't exist. I frankly think that it wasn't very, wasn't a wise move for Prime Minister Trudeau to invoke that term. There was no reason to. Uh, I, I know, you know, we know why he was trying to do it. He was trying to gener you know, generate support. He was, trying to the get the he was trying to get the rest of the West together, right? To get, yeah, here's right. India now standing up trying to upturn the rules-based order, mm -hmm. which is what I think he was trying to do. Right, exactly. Right, well, Michael, let's see where this shapes up. Let's also try and get some sense from other experts on where this is headed. Thank you so much for joining us. Always a pleasure. pleasure. And good to meet you in person here. Very nice Aren't to meet you, you as well. <laughs> well, let's now turn our attention to the history of uh, Khalistani terrorism and extremism in Canada and why many people feel that Canada perhaps has been a little bit soft on this issue over the years. It's great to be joined now by Terry Milievsky, who's a Canadian journalist, also the person who's the author of Blood for Blood, 50 Years of the Global Khalistani Project. Terry, great to have you joining us. I guess one of the reasons why so many people in India are bemused to see all of these pictures of Khalistani extremism and demonstrations and all of this ruckus that we see in countries like Canada is because Khalistan itself is a dead issue in India. It is a dead issue among the Sikhs in India. It's a dead issue in Indian Punjab. And perhaps no better way of demonstrating that than the fact that in the last, the, the last time you had elections in Punjab, the pro-Khalistani party only got 2.4% of the vote. So clearly there's not much resonance of any of this in India itself. It, it, it is. I think it was something like 2.48, you know, so given exactly. that they, 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 they nearly made it all the way to 2.5 percent of the vote in Punjab. And this is something you're quite right to point it out, I think, uh, that, that there's, there's such ignorance about this issue in the West. People not paying attention. It's not our problem. It's far away. It's been going on forever. It's bad news anyway. And much of the story in Canada's case does not reflect well on Canada anyway. So we'd rather not talk about it. And so people don't, are, are simply not aware of the extent to which this issue has fallen off the map really 30 years ago in India, uh, that there is no support for it among the majority of the world's Sikhs. I mean, we've got roughly 75% of all the world's Sikhs live in Punjab. And uh, you, you'd think their votes would count for something. I mean, mind you, that 2.5% they got in last year's election, I should point out, was a banner year. That was a good year for the separatist party of uh, Samrajit Singh Man, uh, because in the previous election in, in 2017, they got 0.3% of the vote, barely moved the needle above zero. No time, none of the above got more votes than the separatists did in that election. So uh, this is something which is completely uh, unknown among most Canadians who think that, you know, all the Sikhs are Khalistanis and uh, that this is the will of the Sikhs and the Sikhs say they're being uh, 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 genocided, as they call it, in, in uh, India. They're being wiped out by, and I quote, a fascist and genocidal uh, Hindu government, and uh, therefore we should feel sympathetic to them. And, uh, uh, and uh, India uh, is to be vilified and this sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a very, there's a huge disconnect between reality and the way this issue is perceived in Canada and elsewhere in the West. Uh, the UK is another example where the propaganda of the Khalistanis has, to, in large measure, succeeded. That is to say, uh, the, the rest of us have failed to get the message across. All right, Terry, one of the other things that is mystifying many people, I don't want to get into the question of the assassination itself, whether it happened or didn't happen, there's no evidence that has been presented. But the entire question of justifying violence, justifying terrorism. Look, demonstrations do happen in, in democratic countries. But the fact that many of those people in, in, in uh, Canada are actually calling for violence, they've been involved with terrorism, 
and yet there's been a very soft response. How does that tie in with the, with the rule of law? The government and the, and the general public, I would say, are basically in lockstep on this question, that uh, they, they are locked into an outdated model of the terrorism that is supposedly to be fought. What I mean is that they are locked into the idea that, well, terrorism is bombs going off. And there are no bombs going off. They're not blowing things up. So we're in the clear, right? There's nothing to worry about. Well, the problem, of course, as you rightly noted, is that there is instead a new model of terrorism, which is the propaganda, the disinformation, the misinformation, the burrowing into the political system, and the, uh, the poisoning of the minds of children uh, by a tide, really, uh, an unseen tide by most people, I grant you, but there is a tide of disinformation online. Everybody can be a Khalistani holy warrior simply if they have an internet connection and a keyboard. And so they're all, uh, uh, maybe not under their own names, of course, because they don't want to run too many risks, but everyone can proselytize and broadcast curses and call down invective upon the heads of the uh, Indian government while simultaneously uh, uh, propagandizing about uh, the uh, the genocide uh, that is ongoing, according to Gopatwan Singh Panoon, the, uh, the voice of Sikhs for Justice, which is organizing the current referendum. They can say, for example, uh, that uh, the referendum is all about democracy, uh, that it's about, and I quote Panoon again, uh, ballots, not bullets. Oh, no, we're peaceful now. We're past the old days of blowing things up. And 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 what did he? Who's the poster boy of the campaign again? Chosen by the same panoon, the poster boy of the campaign. And I'm talking nine foot high posters, the size of a side of a building, glass with ceremonial sword and ornate uh, a turban of Tulvinder Singh Pama, the mastermind, of course, of the Kanishka bombing, the Air India bombing of 1985, which wiped out 331 completely innocent civilians. Uh, and, and so this is his chosen mascot or po poster boy after whom the referendum campaign uh, that is supposed to be so peaceful is named. This, this man was a psychopath. And, and, but it's not just him. There's the voting center in Toronto that is named for a Toronto mass murderer who joined the Khalistan Tiger Force in, uh, in Pakistan back in the day. Uh, there are the Australian voting centers named after the assassins of Indira Gandhi in 1984. I won't go on, but you get the point. So, Terry, the aspect of this is somewhat mystifying to many people watching this in Canada is, first of all, all of these referendums that are happening. You're having a referendum to say, oh, something in another part of the world should have independence or should have freedom. It's a bit strange because as we were just discussing, there's no echo of that anywhere in India. It's a bit like me sitting in New Delhi and saying, oh, there should be a referendum or whether, I don't know, there should be independence in Addis Ababa or in South Africa or, you know, Canada and some, some province. That's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is a lot of this is actual incitement of violence and terrorism. And surely that is something that should bother the Canadians also. It should bother, bother the Canadian government, bother the Canadian people. And let's not forget that one of those acts of terrorism was actually one of the worst acts of terrorism ever affecting Canada. And I'm referring, of course, to the bombing of the Air India plane. So many Canadians lost their lives. This should be an emotive issue, not just in India, but also in Canada. Well, they don't feel the pain. They don't see the impact. Uh, they don't see, as I say, nobody's blowing up Canada. And so if they're sending money to India to blow things up in India, uh, well, not our problem. They're not attacking us. Uh, we're in our safe uh, little cocoon and uh, we're not concerned with it. Uh, and at the same time, the, 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 the sort of rolling series of videos and provocations that emanate from the Khalistanis in Canada is really quite remarkable when you come to think about it. I mean, Brampton, Ontario, so little Punjab, if you like, in, in Canadian terms, uh, where they had in June of this year, uh, we're not talking old news. We're talking about, you know, in this year, uh, they had this uh, enormous life-size tableau, a diorama, uh, a life-size reenactment 
celebrating the assassination of Indira Gandhi in 1984, uh, or with plenty of red paint splattered uh, on the prime minister's sari of the figure of, uh, of Mrs. Gandhi, so that uh, kids would be sure to get the message. This was a bloody affair, number, number one. Number two, we are proud of it. So that's, um, that's the kind of thing which goes on in Canada. Uh, and of, of course, we also have to take note of the, the what I call the killer posters, naming and shaming Indian diplomats. Danny, I just want to come back again to that question of the rule of law, because look, I guess the point that is being made by Canada, by the US, by many in the West is, you can't go around having targeted assassinations in a friendly country, especially a democratic country, especially a country where the judicial process actually works. That's the argument. And let's be honest, it's a fair argument. But the flip side of that is, what happens if that judicial process is not working? What happens if for 40 years, you're going on saying, this is something that is happening there. There are people who are inciting violence and terrorism. Those are people who are going to come and kill people in our country, kill people in India, potentially reignite flames and fires that were put out many, many years ago, two decades, three decades ago. So when that happens, and when nobody is paying heed to those concerns, and the judicial system is not working, then what happens? I guess that's one of the big questions that has to be asked now. Yes, what do you do? And, and, and this is something that Canadians, I think, so far have not appreciated uh, w well enough. Uh, and that is that it, they get the idea that we don't want other countries uh, pursuing their critics into our land and then you know, be pursued and, and murdered by a foreign government. Uh, they get that. Uh, but the, the the problem is that they don't see uh, that the, the, that this danger impacts uh, Canadians where they live, and they see that um, they haven't appreciated enough. I think the frustration on the Indian side at what amounts to basically forty years, a generation and more of neglect by Canadians of uh, Indian concerns. I mean that. You know, you go all the way back to 1982. Uh, and I, I was the one that dug out of the archives the records of that uh, when uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, Justin Trudeau's father, told Indira Gandhi, no, we're not going to extradite Calvin de Palma, the Air India bomber. Uh, he was wanted for murder in India for killing a couple of policemen. They asked for uh, formally for extradition. And the Canadians said, no, we didn't want to get involved in uh, India's internal squabbles. Uh, we didn't want to take sides. Uh, and uh, besides, uh, we thought that Parma wouldn't get a fair trial in India. So we came up with an excuse. It was a very bizarre excuse because India didn't acknowledge the Queen as head of state, only as head of the Commonwealth. Therefore, the extradition treaty didn't apply. It was very almost comical excuse that they dreamed up to tell Mrs. Gandhi, no, that was three years before the Air India bombing. If he'd said yes, we'd all be a lot better off today. Uh, so that's an example, and it just continued all the way through. We ignored the, uh, the warnings about the imminent attack on Air India. Uh, the RCMP were asleep at the switch. CSIS was asleep at the switch. And that's before the bombing, when they should have stopped it. They had the, they had the suspects under surveillance, for heaven's sake, for three months before the bombing and still didn't figure. They followed them to a test bombing in the woods. They still didn't figure out what was up to. They still didn't do anything about it. And then, after the bombing, they failed again. They, I mean the Canadians, by failing to deliver to the victims' families some measure of justice. Uh, the, the court system, the legal system, was seemed to be mainly occupied with discarding evidence that was deemed inadmissible. I'll spare you the details. It was a sorry display, and only one man the bomb maker went to jail uh, and the rest got off scot-free. Uh, Palmar, of course, himself was killed in Punjab by the Punjab police uh, in 1992. So all of this unfolded uh, in an atmosphere of almost complete indifference on the Canadian side. If the Indians got frustrated that Canada never acted, uh, the Canadians didn't even know that. Uh, it, what, what, people like me dropped the ball in the in the media failing to alert them i did a documentary 20 years ago called safe haven describing how i thought anyway that uh, canada had been a patsy and that uh, uh, 
drop the ball by not cracking down on terrorists operating in Canada. And it's the measure of my immense influence in Canada. That absolutely nobody paid any attention to my documentary. And, and it only proceeded to get worse, not better. Indifference is the enemy here. And that explains in large measure the Indian frustration. And it almost explains, no, it doesn't go quite that far, but it almost explains why uh, a, a hardline Indian prime minister might just decide the hell with it. These Canadians are never going to do what is, what is needed. I'm going to act. All right, Terry, I guess if people had paid a lot more attention to this many, many years ago, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation that we're in. But thank you so much for joining us with that thank perspective. Thank you. Well, let's now move to another one of our regular segments on the India story, which is what the global press has been saying about India. And not surprisingly, those Canadian charges and those Canadian allegations pretty much dominated a lot of the global press this week. Canada's Toronto's Global and Mail in its editorial has raised questions on Justin Trudeau's actions. The article points out that Trudeau has not yet disclosed the evidence behind the allegations, leaving Canadians and the opposition parties in the dark. The editorial goes on to say that the Canadian leader must present his case immediately to gather support for himself and his party, both domestically and on the global stage. According to an opinion piece by CNN, Trudeau has found himself in a potentially costly diplomatic dogfight with the world's most populous democracy, India, at exactly the time he needs support from Delhi the most. CNN points out that India is the most important counterbalance that the West has to China, which probably explains why Canada's main ally, the United States, is sitting resolutely on the sidelines. According to the American newspaper Foreign Policy, the United States has been notably silent on the matter, possibly because it sees India as a more strategically valuable ally than Canada. Given India's growing economy and its role as a counterweight to China, the article also raises concerns about the United States prioritizing geopolitical interests over democratic values in its foreign policy decisions, both with India and other nations like Saudi Arabia and Israel. China Daily, quoting experts, suggests that the role of US and Five Eyes intelligence should be a wake-up call for India, as it still remains outside of the US core allies circle, and in fact may never become one. The article further says that the alleged assassination also tarnishes India's global image and could potentially have a long-lasting negative influence on future cooperation between India and Western nations. Sri Lanka's Foreign Minister Ali Sabri told Indian media outlet ANI this week that terrorists have found safe haven in Canada. The Sri Lankan government, which has relied heavily on Indian support amid an economic crisis, had its own spat with Canada this year over Trudeau's statements, remembering anti-Tamil violence on the island in 1983. Trudeau referred to the bloodshed, which left anywhere from hundreds to several thousand dead as a genocide. All right, let's now get another perspective on where this entire situation could potentially head. Great to be joined now by Derek Grossman, who's, uh, who's with the RAND Corporation, been following this very closely, writing extensively about it as well. Derek, thank you so much for joining us. How do you see this moving forward now? Are we heading for some sort of a resolution or do you think things are going to get a lot worse before they start to settle down? Yeah, so I mean, I think a lot is still to be determined, right? I mean, we're only about a week into this diplomatic row, as you mentioned. And so we may see a number of twists and turns to come. But I think the main uh, issue right now is what kind of evidence does Canada have? as part of its investigation into, into uh, the allegation that India committed an extrajudicial killing on its, on its territory. Uh, and it, it is unclear whether Canada is able or willing to uh, allow that information to become public. Uh, I think the more likely scenario is that Canada will share whatever it has behind the scenes with uh, Indian intelligence and with Indian officials. Uh, and there will be, you know, my, and this is my hope as well, that there will be kind of a quiet negotiation bilaterally between the two in order to resolve uh, 
uh, the differences that we've seen um, explode onto the scene uh, in, you know, in the last week. You know, Derek, you're right. I mean, it wouldn't mean one thing if all of that had happened before the charges had actually been made public. But now that we are where we are, and Canada can keep saying you need to cooperate in the investigation, and I guess that's what America is saying as well. But I think from an Indian point of view, there is a very legitimate expectation right now that at some point, Canada and other countries have to start taking the entire question of violence and terrorism and the incitement of violence inside India and the incitement of violence inside Punjab by these Khalistani militants and extremists, it has to be taken seriously. Because as you well know, this has no echo, this has no resonance inside India itself. Punjab is peaceful. And here are people trying to whip up trouble in what is right now a peaceful state. And that's why there is that expectation that at some point, Canada has got to turn its attention towards dealing with the extremism. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I think that as part of the negotiations, there will have there will have to be a discussion about, you know, how are you how from the Indian side to Canada, how will Canada handle this uh, in the future? And will it kind of meet the standards of what India is looking for based upon the um, as, as from New Delhi's perspective, this threat of terrorism and secessionism uh, that, you know, some Sikhs within Canada and elsewhere, and perhaps within India, uh, you know, what they seek to achieve with a, with an independent Khalistan, right? And so that is something that I think will have to be part of the negotiations. But I also think that Canada will stress that as a Democrat, as, as a fellow Democratic country that respects its citizens' uh, civil liberties and their freedom of, of speech and their privacy, uh, that there's only so much Canada will be willing and able to do in that circumstance. All right, Drake, I'm going to turn to something else that you've been tweeting about and a lot of people have been talking about. Do India and the West have the same values? Is there a question of shared values? And there are some people, including yourself and others, who've been sometimes questioning whether there is really that sense of shared values or not. Uh, and I guess when you talk about that in questions like democratic backsliding and others, sometimes there are people in India who would agree with some of those concerns. On this particular issue, there's been a lot of unanimity. And I think one of the reasons why there has been that unanimity is because surely shared values also have to reflect shared concerns about each other's problems. You can't say, my terrorist is a big problem, your terrorist is fine. I guess what a lot of people in India are actually questioning and asking is, what happens if you keep on expressing concerns, as have been expressed to the Canadians for 40 years? These are people whipping up terrorism. These are people whipping up violence. And if you don't take those concerns on board, not for six months, one year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, if you don't take those concerns on board, what should you do? What would the United States do? What would other countries in the West do? What would Canada do? What should you do if somebody does not pay heed? To your concerns, even if you share values. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a number of issues here. I mean, but I'll just say that the U.S. is in a pretty tough spot because, yes, there, of course, have been times in which the U.S. has felt that countries uh, have harbored terrorists and have not done enough to address their terrorist threat, and the U.S. has taken unilateral action, whether it's through drone strikes or, or other means, right? And so, I'm hearing a lot from Indians these days about how it is, you know, contradictory, right, for the U.S. to say, it's hypocritical, right, for the U.S. to say that, you know, India, let's let's say for a second that India actually did do this in Canada, right? Well, it's hypocritical to say that the Indians should not be, not have been allowed to do this when the U.S. has done this, this type of thing in the past, right? And when you bring up the shared values point, the Biden administration and the Modi uh, government has uh, repeatedly talked about how both sides uh, have shared values on democracy, right? But I think uh, there all have also been brewing concerns within the United States and perhaps in other Western countries as well that Modi's government is increasingly an illiberal government and that it is not necessarily a government that shares the same values as the United States and the broader West. And I know that this irks India tremendously, right? Obviously, India is the largest post-colonial state, 
right? And the, and co colonization and, and imperialism came from the West, right? So any sort of criticism of India on on, on that, you know, uh, from from that perspective is is usually very kind of uh, un, unwanted uh, throughout India, right? But at the same time, it's important to underscore that when we talk about in this country shared values, we do kind of have a certain standard that we expect our fellow democratic countries to follow. Uh, are we hypocritical? I think there are elements of that that also need to be addressed. But as Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken said when he visited India back in 2021, this is a two-way street. We are no longer going to lecture other countries. I'm paraphrasing here. We're no longer going to lecture other countries on democracy and human rights. We will express our concerns and our partners and our allies should also express their concerns and it should be sort of a co-equal dialogue. So I think if the Biden administration does get involved in this, is, this issue, it will probably be along similar lines. So Derek, I'm just wondering whether there's an appreciation for that difference of opinion in India. When Prime Minister Modi came here to the White House and there were segments of the American press and segments of American and other Western opinion which said, or oh, we must turn our attention to the question of democratic backsliding and the freedom of the press and individual rights. There were people in India who said, yes, those are legitimate concerns and those should be addressed and they should be debated and those should be talked about. This time, I think the reason why there is that unanimity of opinion in India is because what's at stake out here are questions of terrorism, questions of territorial integrity, questions of not whipping up passions in a place which is now quiet. And those are really important questions, which I think need to be addressed. And that's why you're having so much unanimity in India on this particular question. Yeah, yeah, no, I think I think you're right about that. And, you know, as a as an outsider, right, I'm still trying to understand why there is such unanimity. Uh, but I do think that it kind of opens up multiple um, concerns that Indians have. I mean, obviously, the terrorism and secessionism concern, right? But also, I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, which is, you know, Western countries doing things that India doesn't like. And India, you know, now having the ability to respond in kind, unlike perhaps previously, right? Because we saw the Indians, for example, cut off um, visa services for Canadians worldwide, right? You know, th things like that, that India may not have felt comfortable doing in the past, now they are comfortable doing, right? And so I think that there's also an element of, and I've said this publicly many times, that I believe India is an emerging great power. And there are growing pains as part of that emergence as a great power, both for India, but also for the international community, right? Because now everybody has to understand, well, what does that mean? And how do we interact with India? And how does India interact with the rest of the world? So there's kind of a lot of that is almost kind of at a from a, you know, microcosm type of level, right? It's all sort of built into this India-Canada dispute that we're seeing play out right now. All right, Derek Grossman, thank you so much for joining us and sharing all those perspectives with us. It was great talking to you as always. Well, let's now try and wrap up by getting an overall view on where the future of this heads to, what impact this has had, if any, on the India story, especially here in Washington, D.C. Great to have with us Lisa Curtis, who's Senior Federal Director of the Indo-Pacific Security Program at the Center for a New American Security. It's a, it's a long title, Lisa, which is why I was making sure I got it absolutely correct. But thank you so much for joining us. It's great to meet you in person here in front of the White House. Um, now that we've had some time to think about the aftermath of these accusations that were made by Justin Trudeau, what is your sense of how it's all panning out? Well, I think already the um, allegations have started to die down. And I think that, you know, while the Biden administration uh, took these very seriously, you know, Canada is an ally of the United States, uh, India, a very important partner for the United States, um, you know, the U.S. did take these allegations seriously. But I think over the long run, I don't think that this, this issue will disrupt the U.S.-India relationship. I think the Biden administration has invested far too much in this relationship. You look at the successful state visit that happened just a few months ago. And it's not right just here. the Biden administration, by the way, it was also 
Trump before that, Obama before that, Bush before that. So it's been a been many administrations doing it. Well, I think that's right. I think the U.S. has invested a tremendous amount over, you know, Republican and Democratic administrations over the last 20 years. But even particularly what we've seen in the last six months, you know, with the state visit, with the very productive meeting between President Biden and Prime Minister Modi at the G20. Um, we've heard numerous times President Biden refer to the relationship with India as the most important in the 21st century. Uh, just last night, I heard the White House Indo-Pacific coordinator, Kurt Campbell, again talk about India being the most important relationship for the United States. And look, maybe six, seven years ago, the allegations made, might have had more reverberations within the U.S. system. But I think now we look at the um, very serious competition between the United States and China. It's the number one foreign policy issue for the Biden administration. And India is seen as a critical partner in dealing with and managing this competition with China. And I think that also impacts uh, the situation. To what extent uh, does that change? I mean, look, let's face it, right now no evidence has been put forward. And I think it's going to become increasingly embarrassing for Justin Trudeau the longer time span passes before any evidence is being put forward. The question being asked, even in Canada, forget about by India or, or by the others. If there is any actual evidence that comes out, then does that change the dynamics? Well, I don't think it's embarrassing for Justin Trudeau, let me just say that. Uh, but I think that, you know, if there were to be credible evidence put forward that that would uh, force President Biden's hand. He would have to respond in some way uh, because, you know, like you said, there, have, there haven't been any uh, evidence put forward yet. It's, it's been allegations. But were that to happen, I think it would force Biden's hand to, to do something, say something. Um, but again, even so, I think in the long run, this issue won't disrupt the sort of broad trajectory of the U.S.-India relationship. I think it will weather this storm. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we have to look at the long term and everything that's been invested in the relationship, the stakes that are involved with the U.S.-India relationship and the competition with China. And when you take all of that into account, I don't see that that's going to be disrupted over the long term. Let me just ask you the broader question, though, because let's set these immediate charge, you know, uh, uh, questions and charges aside for a minute. On the broader question of what a rules-based order should look like, what should international security look like? And I was saying this earlier in the program as well. There are revisionist powers who say we should not have any of this, China or, of course, maybe Russia. But if there is to be a rules-based order, I think the question that many in India are asking now is, how does that apply for everybody? How do you have a rules-based order? You can say, don't assassinate a citizen in a foreign a friendly country. Fair enough. What should that friendly country do if there's somebody inside that country encouraging terrorism in another democracy? Well, what happens in a situation like that? This certainly is a question about a rules-based order. And, and we all saw uh, the reaction to the um, poisoning of Skripal, uh, the Russian citizen, by uh, the Russian KGB in Britain uh, a few years ago. And there was a, a, a you know, strong retaliation and reaction to that. So this certainly, you know, does involve questions of a rules-based order and rule of law. But the, 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 the case is not exactly comparable because it's not as if Russia had been asking Britain to act against terrorism or Skripal was involved in terrorist activities or encouraging terrorist activities. So there would be people in India who would say the comparison should be more with what happened in the Middle East, for example, or against terror groups in the Middle East. Well, you know, I don't want to I get into specifics. I mean, you know, the debate, this debate has been yeah. going on for a while. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to get into specifics, but this is a Canadian citizen on Canadian territory. We certainly cannot have citizens being killed uh, within their territory. It's just not something that would support a rules-based order. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying that's what the Indian government is saying, by the way. They are saying very clearly we didn't do it. I'm just saying this is a, on social media and in various Indian TV channels, this is a question that is coming up at a, at a, at a broader level. When it comes to the path forward now, we actually were seeing a certain momentum going, and it's been sort of up and down. Prime Minister Modi was here not that long back. It was a very successful state visit. 
uh, questions were asked even at that time by many people here in America. And in G20, which seemed to have been a great success. Is that trajectory continuing to move or has this entire episode put a pause on it or a question mark? I think the broader trajectory of, you know, India's successful handling of the G20, all of the achievements that came out of the G20, these still stand. Uh, you have the entrance into the G20 of the African Union, something that India shepherded. Uh, you have the Digital Public Infrastructure Initiative, another thing that India really pushed. Uh, you have the Middle East, India, Europe uh, transport and energy corridor that was announced. This is something that is in the beginning stages but will continue to move forward. So I think you know, all of the tangible successes that came out of the G20 still stand, will still move forward. But I do think that uh, this has put a bit of a damper um, on the you know sort of you know bright glow that surrounded Modi immediately following the G20. Certainly, this episode has has dampened that to some degree. But again, I think you know you things do, you are think, already. You think it has dampened dampened it in in the White House in Washington in general? You think that there is a question mark now? Uh, no, I think what I'm saying is so that the halo has gone a little. The bit. halo has gone a little bit, but the investment in the long-term strategic relationship is still there. Um, that is not changing. None of the fundamentals of the the U.S.-India relationship have changed, um, and are not likely to change unless uh, unless China suddenly starts behaving itself or changes itself dramatically. Uh, well, I I don't even think that that it's will change the fundamental China. relationship. I don't. I think I'm saying that. Um, I think the U.S.-India relationship has been growing over the last 20 years. Look, most of my career has been invested in growing this relationship. It's been happening over a long period of time. A lot of it has to do with the economics, the people to, <coughs> excuse me, people to people ties, and the uh, the overall convergence of. Uh, long-term strategic interest of the two countries. Yeah. So even if China were to start behaving and, uh, as you say, or you know, become a responsible stakeholder in, in the international order, I think the U.S.-India relationship would still be fundamentally important and would continue to grow. All right, and would that survive irrespective of who's going to be here a year and a half from now, you think? Of course. Yeah. Irrespective of that. Uh, U.S. democracy is, is uh, strong and um, is, is moving on and, uh, you know, we, we'll continue to um, uh, be a strong democracy. Lisa Curtis, thank you so much. Thank you. And that is all we have for you on this episode of the India Story, a special episode where we're here in Washington to try and understand how the charges that Canada has made could affect India's relations with the US and with the West. We'll be back again next week with another episode of the India Story. Bye for now.